Thanks, Shana. Good job. So many great things happening. I love it. Thanks, Adam. Oh, it feels so nice. Gosh, so good. I feel like during worship, we stepped into something, and whatever you were walking in before, we were supposed to leave it behind. As we were in the presence of the Lord and giving him our heart anew and afresh and saying our heart burns for you, you can only hold on to so many things at once. And there's certain things, even if you want justice, even if you want vengeance, even if no matter what you want, we're supposed to let it go. And we say, God, you could have all of our heart. Should we say yes to that? All of it. We'll take it all, Lord. Oh, hi, Louise. Good to see you. So good to be here. Okay, so today I want to talk about something that I've already talked about not that long ago. You know, like, we've already done this. I'm like, Lord, really? We're going to do this again? Yeah, we're going to do it again. And um, I think, oh gosh, I'm trying to think how much I want to share. Holy Spirit, I just welcome you to come. I welcome you to come. I only want to say what you want me to say. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, I want to start with a testimony. Testimony is um, I went to the doctor at the end of July, and um, I said, oh, I know I need a mammogram. I'm getting older, you know, and Eric's mom died of breast cancer a year ago in July. It's just something we've got to walk through as a family, a family of faith that we believe the Lord heals. We know he heals. We know Jesus came, gave his life by his stripes. We are healed on earth as it is in heaven. That's how we're to pray. I'm like, that's how we pray. I know his heart for us. And I've gotten to watch different people that we have fought for, prayed, and watched them pass away. And you're like, okay, I don't understand this, Lord, but this is where I stand. I know who you are, and I'm going to continue to stand in that place. So that little backdrop. I go to the doctor, and um, I say, I need a mammogram. It's time. I need to get established here in Greenville. I go get a mammogram, and of course, they're like, oh, we see stuff we don't like. We need you to come back. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and actually, it looks so not good that we want you to have a biopsy. Like, okay, okay, well that doesn't sound very fun. What do we do when we get news that we don't like, that we cannot control? I'm going to pray, Lord, because I know who you are, and I'm gonna sit underneath who you are as my Lord and Savior and as my strong tower. And I get the opportunity to wait a couple weeks, because you know it never happens really fast, so you have time to kind of simmer and wiggle and squiggle. And I go back, and honestly, my praise report is that I really felt like I feel victory in the sense that even over those weeks, I was sleeping fine. I was thanking the Lord, but there was real stuff going on as well. So I go back, and I get a biopsy, and then you wait more time. And you're like, okay, I hope it all goes well. I had people praying for me and, of course, believing for a good report. And um, they called me, and... I'm like, hello, how are you? Fine, can you just tell me what you need to tell me? <laughs> and they said, you know, all your scans, it all came back clean. Your biopsy came back clean. I'm like, thank you so much. Yeah, so good. Really, it came back clean? It did. Okay, thank you, Lord. But the doctor doesn't want to let it go yet because the scan doesn't really look that good. He wants you to have another biopsy. Okay, okay, okay. So, and just know this was the last time I spoke. I think I spoke about uh, betrayal. I, that was weekend. I was waiting for that biopsy. So I'm waiting. So I had to go back, get a biopsy, and then you wait again. I'm like, okay, Lord, this is, I don't, I love, I felt encouraged that there was one clean biopsy, but I don't love that they want a second one. How many people get two biopsies? This is not good. So I'm going to stay in a place of peace. I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to pray. So we wait again, and I get another call. And, um, hi, how are you? Fine, can you just tell me what you need to tell me? Well, I just want you to tell you that it all came back clean again. And you are completely fine. Thank you, Lord. That's, that's, my, that's my report. But through that lovely experience again, just get reminded that there are so many things in life that come at us, come against us. There are swirls, and we get the opportunity to decide how we're going to respond and live. See, we are actually in a battle. Jesus is Lord, and he is our shepherd, and we are the sheep, and we get to decide how we're going to live this life. And I tell you, he has already invited us to come in and to take a place of standing and not to get battle, battered by the waves and be tossed around. 
But we get to choose how we want to do this. And that's one thing when I, got, when I got the opportunity to walk through this, I'm like, I am not going to get robbed of my time between now and tell my good report. I am going to sleep well. I went to go visit my daughter in LA and we are going to have fun. But I have to tell you, I had to keep the tightest rein on my mind. Because you know where the battle takes place. Because you're going to stand in faith. Where do you think you stand in faith? In what you partner with. In what you choose to believe. And I'm talking about this because I'm watching, I'm experiencing it, and I'm watching so many of us battle discouragement. We're battling fear. We're battling anxiety. And it's not because we're crazy. It's because things are really happening. And so I want to talk to you because my heart is that we become all who God's created us to be, and we stand and walk in all of those places. And I want us to look better in a month, in a year, that we actually learn how to stand and get rooted on who he is. And see, the thing that I see about culture is culture would say it's about fulfilling self. It's about knowing your dreams and your desires and making sure you get everything that you need and fulfill them. But when I read the gospel and I hear the words of Jesus, it's actually about dying to yourself. It's the opposite. So even when we pray, it's like, oh, even the statement, I am enough. We are enough. And I'm like, we are enough. Actually, we're not. Melissa's talking about sheep and shepherd and, and actually the nature of sheep and how they need a shepherd And that's exactly who we are in the Bible. We are the sheep and he is our shepherd. I'm like, yeah, we actually are not enough. We actually need a savior. We need a savior. We need a Lord and a king of our life. So we are not enough, actually. We're enough for his love. And it's aimed at us, but we need him. And everything isn't based on us. That's one thing I can. You find it all in yourself. Well, the king of love lives inside of me, the hope of glory but it's actually all because of him. And that's why I don't want to miss it, church. As we follow Jesus, that we would not get confused and think that it's actually us. It's all based in him. So today I want to talk about how do we stand in that place? How do we stand and actually go from glory to glory, even in the midst when things come against us? And I just want to say thank you for everyone who did pray for me. Thank you for those who stand with me. And it's an honor when I get to do that with you to be able to stand together. And that's what I love about being a part of a community and being a part of a family because we were never meant to do this alone. And sometimes we need each other and we don't have anything left inside of us. Or we're scared and we're like, gosh, I need your courage right now. Do you know how powerful belief is? Belief is so powerful. And sometimes we don't have it. When someone has it, I'm like, that's enough. I'll, I'll take yours. And so thanks for being who you guys are as well. So I'm going to talk about standing um, today. And I want to um, read Ephesians 6. This is a scripture about the whole armor of God. This is before it talks about the armor of God. And I just love how it starts off. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I love that right there because it tells me exactly where we get our strength from and where we anchor ourselves, and it's not in ourselves. Be strong because you are strong. Actually, we're strong because of who he is, what he's done for us, and what he's given us. And when you're at the end of your rope, just remember that. And when things have come against you and you're waiting for the reports or you're not sure where you're going to live next, let's not forget who he is and what he Um, is giving us and offering us. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the the wiles of the devil. I love the word to stand as well. How are we supposed to do this thing? Are we getting drugged through life? Are we getting battered and beat up through life? No, he's actually called us to stand. He says later on that we're in a war and we're, um, we're supposed to stand. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. That is our portion. That is our destiny. And that's why I want to talk about this because I believe that it all begins somewhere. And I believe it's the mind. When you look at the whole armor of God, it takes he 
talks about different pieces of armor. And the first one is the um, belt of truth. And how we learn to stand is actually need to know what truth is. And knowing what truth is in your mind, in your heart, that's how you learn to stand. And one of the other pieces of armor is a shield of faith. It's important what we believe, what we believe to be true, because that's what you're ultimately going to stand on. When stuff comes against you, are you believing the circumstance more? Are you believing your feelings more? Or are you believing, oh, no, he's already paid the price for this? I actually know that more than what I can see is what I know what I can't see. And that's faith. And I believe the Lord wants to strengthen our faith today, no matter where we're at on this journey, no matter what we've experienced thus far. Isaiah 26 um, verse 3 and 4, I want to read in the Amplified because I love the way that it, he, they go actually go in and explain the scripture out of uh, more than the other translations. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, you will keep in perfect and constant peace. Doesn't that sound good? Like, I don't know what it's going to say next, but how do I get that? Perfect and constant peace, the one whose mind is steadfast. And this is where it goes in explanation. That is committed and focused on you in both inclination and character because he trusts and takes refuge in you. That's with hope and confident expectation. Trust confidently in the Lord forever, for he is your fortress, your shield, your banner. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, the rock of ages. What an incredible scripture that we actually get the opportunity to walk out. What great instruction. Do you want to know how to stand no matter what's going on? There we go right here. Who do we trust in? You know what trust is? Who do you put your confidence in? Oh, I'm confident that this is going to be bad. Uh-oh. Is there another option? Is there somewhere else I can put my trust? Oh, actually, I'm confident in who you are. You're a provider and you're a shepherd. And you know me more than anyone else. You know me. You know exactly what I need, God. And I trust you with my life. You're the one who numbers my days. It's not the doctors. It's not the report. It's you. And I trust you with my life. I trust you with my friend's life. These are places that we get the opportunity to walk. I love, Melissa, when you were uh, even talking about David and, and um, being with the sheep and even describing the scenario of how important it is for sheep to know the voice of the shepherd. And that's what, when, I, when I read the Gospels and I read about Jesus, in John 10, verse 3, it says, The shepherd leads and they follow, and they know his voice. It says, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings them, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. I remember when um, I gave birth to our first daughter, Kennedy, and she came out, and um, Eric was there, and she's crying, and then Eric begins to talk talk and the nurse is holding her and she turns her head towards him and she stops crying and I sat there going oh, she knows his voice it's so crazy how powerful our voices are but then the familiarity and then of you talk parents and the people that are closest to you and I love being able to watch that but in here it talks about the sheep and they follow him because they know his voice. Do we know the voice of God? Because how do we stand if we don't? And I want to share a story. I shared this again earlier this year, but I want to share it again because it's a time when I maybe I learned a lot, but I didn't actually figure it out until afterwards. And it's when the, Eric and I are in our first year of marriage, and he gets the opportunity to go to Brazil. In that first season, we got to travel everywhere together, and we love the nations, love traveling and giving investing into different countries and leaders. And um, it was a last-minute trip. Someone had canceled, and so he came home and said, I get the opportunity to go to Brazil, and there, I have to go next week, though. And um, we were like, oh, wow, that's, that's cool. I mean, it's only you and not me. 
you're going to go on a trip without me. That's so sad, but how fun, you know. And um, so we, we talked about it, and we decided, yes, you should go on this trip, and all the expenses paid. And um, as it got closer, we started, you know, talking about what happens on trips and, and even what a long travel it is. And I think maybe a plane had crashed somewhere in the world that week. And so our conversations quickly began to be a little bit riddled with fear, where we were like, Gosh, that's a long time, and you're going to go all the way over to Brazil. Gosh, and that plane crashed this last week. What if yours crashes? Like, do you think you should still go if it's going to crash? We started talking like this. And, um, and uh, we were like, gosh, we don't know. Should we go if we know that you're going to die? That, then it, that's how it became next. Then we're like, is this the Lord warning us that you should not go to Brazil? Because... I love being married to you, but it's only been like 10 months. And so like two days passed, but then it was like two, three more days, and he was supposed to get ready to go. And, um, but we started to really be tormented. It first started out a little conversation, and there were tears because we really did love being married. And um, so the thought of him dying was sad. <laughs> but if God wants you to die on the airplane, then we should not say no. So we were really... <laughs> This is what happens in your house when you, like, we were both there, too. So this is not a, this is not a testimony, this part. <laughs> this actually happened. And we were adults and leaders in a church. And, um, <laughs> and so we were really having a hard time knowing what we should do. And um, we, would, we would cry and be like, but, but we would do it if this is what God has for you, you know. And, um, and then we were just sad. I wasn't sleeping very well because I was really sad. But I was willing to send him off to Brazil to die in the plane crash if that's what God has. Because I'm, yeah, I would do that. I don't want to say no. And so we were so tormented. We were like, we, we need to call someone and talk to somebody. See, be thankful that you're in a room full of great people because you should call each other um, when you get in weird places like this. So we call, we call one of our um, kind of friends, mentors, and um, said, we, we need to talk to you. Could we, could we get on the phone with you? We are needing your wisdom. And um, yes, so we get on the phone, and it was Chris and Kathy Valentin, and he's like, so what's going on, you guys? Well, um, we have a question to ask you, because we are not sure if Eric should go to Brazil or not. Okay, well, tell us what's going on. Well, we think that his plane is going to crash, and that he might die, and we don't know if we should still go if he's going to die on his way to Brazil. Do you think he should go? And he's like, oh, okay, wow. Um, so you're afraid that he's going to die on an airplane. And he's so nice he didn't laugh. And, um, <laughs> and we said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, okay, well, um, does God use fear to speak to you? Okay, goodbye. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, well, who do you think is speaking to you then? Thank you. Yep, we're good now. We're good, we're good, we're good. You know, they prayed for us, they were kind, and we were off the phone. But I tell you, everything switched right there because we knew instantly it wasn't God speaking to us because you know that God does not use fear to speak to you. That is not his voice. Do we know the voice of God? We might not have been messed around and wasted like four days of our lives crying and lamenting, tormented, that maybe it was God who was making us afraid that he was going to die in an airplane crash. I tell you, we're supposed to stand, but to stand, we need to know his voice. We need to know truth. You know, he is the truth, the way, and the life. And he doesn't use fear because you know what his name is. You know what Jesus' name is? And... Um, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government upon, um, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He doesn't use fear to talk to us. He's the Prince of Peace. That tells you right now, how do I navigate forward? Even if it doesn't make sense what you see, oh, I can actually hear you, Lord. I can feel you. I have peace right now. 
I have peace. I'm going to keep moving forward. Do you know that's one of the things that I continually navigate by? Because that's how God speaks to me. That's how I know that he is near. And that's how I know he's gone before me is I have peace. Even if it's, should I buy this house? Should I stand? Should I move forward? What should I do? Oh, even if it looks good, if I don't have peace, I will not move forward. Because I am seeking his face and I know who he is and I know what his voice sounds like. Okay, we're going to wrap up here really quickly. We know that our thoughts are really powerful. There's so many studies about power of thoughts, whether you're talking in things that you visualize and you're playing basketball, if you can visualize it, you, um, you improve significantly, significantly almost as much as those who practice basketball in person physically. There's a, have you heard the placebo effect? <laughs> Placebo, if you, say, have a headache and you need medicine and I give you medicine, if I give you a placebo, it means there's no medicine in there, but you think it's medicine and I give you a sugary pill. Do you know that the, there's been studies called the placebo effect? Estimates of the placebo cure rate, so meaning you were given no medicine, but you thought there was medicine in there just because you think it. Um, they rate, the cure rates from placebo effect range from um, 15% all the way up to 72% um, to curate. The longer the period of treatment and the, larger, and the larger number of physicians' visits, the greater the placebo effect. There was a study, this is in psychology today, a study um, of New Yorkers who were commuters, 300 of them, and they had headaches. So they said, oh, we're going to divide you into groups of 100. And the first group, they did nothing with. They didn't tell them they were giving them anything. You just have headaches, and you get to sit here for half an hour. The next group, they said, actually, we have medicine for you. This is a pain reliever, and we're going to give it to you and wait a half an hour. Then the next group, they had sugary pills full of nothing, but they said, oh, we have medicine for you. This is a pain reliever, and then you're going to wait a half an hour. We just want to see what happens. And guess what happened? The people who they did nothing with and, um, and gave, told them nothing, they, tw 20 of them, 20 out of 100, said their headaches went away. So just time sitting, they got a little better. Um, of the people that were given the medicine, the pain reliever, 90, 90 of them um, got better and didn't have a headache anymore. Of the group that was a placebo group, they were given nothing but believed that they were given something. Um, 50, 45 of them got better. Their headaches went away. There was actually an increase um, of, or their symptoms went away and health they felt healthier because they believed that they were given something. Whatever we believe to be true greatly affects how we are, even changes our physical chemistry. We talk about faith. It's so crazy. Even uh, This was a description towards the end of this article in Psychology Today. The human brain anticipates outcomes, and the anticipation produces those outcomes. The placebo effect is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it follows the patterns you'd predict if the brain were indeed producing its own desired outcomes. I'm like, wow, that almost feels like faith. Things that we stand on that we don't see but we hope for. I'm like, oh, Lord, teach us to stand in you and to be people of faith, that we would know where we're going because we know who you are and we know how to walk there. I'm going to wrap up here um, and... Oh, I don't want to miss this one. 2 Corinthians 10, as I'm wrapping up, this is a super powerful verse. And for us to be able to stand, we have to learn how to do this. When I felt like fear was knocking at my door, and I was thinking, Eric's going to marry somebody else after me. I mean, like, I, there's these crazy thoughts. Like, when I know that I'm going to a biopsy, you just have to think, I, I know people die. I know what happens. And I'm like, oh, no, I have to tell my kids. There's things I'm like, as soon as those would come, they knock. But we get to decide what we do with the thoughts that come. Just because I think it doesn't mean I have to actually feast on it. I can go, whoop, I heard that. Nope, we're not going there. And you know, I did. I created these gates around, and I'm like, Lord, what am I allowed to think about right now? Because that's not where I'm choosing to feast. Just because a thought comes into your brain, it's probably good to ask, where is it coming from? <laughs> First of all, sometimes we just have thoughts. Maybe someone next to me has thoughts. Maybe it's coming from the pit of hell. Maybe it's coming from God. It's good for us to ask, 
Where is it coming from? And then should I be thinking on this? Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish, um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There's so much responsibility in this. This is great instruction, but what do you do with this? When the thoughts come, that's where we stand in faith. That's where whoever we choose to partner with is basically what you choose to agree with. When we choose to agree, then we submit ourselves underneath that. And it can even be another spirit that is contrary to what God says. And so we have to be mindful about what we are choosing to think about. Last scripture, and then we will wrap up. Why don't you just stand with me so we can, I don't want to keep you here longer. Because I tend to go a little longer, and our poor kids have, <laughs> children's workers have to stay longer. I feel like this is really important and really powerful, guys, because you're not to be tormented. That is not your destiny. It's not who God, what God has for us. And for those of us who have been battling discouragement, anxiety, and fear, I just want to say that God has better things for us. That we're not supposed to live being tormented and not sleeping at night because we're worried about everything. Worry doesn't add one day to our life anyways. And our bodies weren't designed to live underneath it. So much sickness and health issues come because we take on and we say yes and we agree to things that we shouldn't. Philippians 4, Philippians 4, let's just end with this one. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I want to encourage you guys, take time to really think about this. But in everything by prayer and supplication, we are invited to come in and to pray. We're invited to come in to present our requests before God. Prayer is so important. Uh, we are going to be cultivating more and more places of prayer because we, um, to take our place in what God has for us, we need to be praying. And then Thanksgiving, let us be a people who know how to cultivate gratitude. Sometimes we miss things just because we're not full of gratitude. We miss what God has for us because we didn't realize it was a gift. <laughs> Let your requests be made known to God, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Anyone need a guard over their heart and mind? We all do. Let's, and then continuing in verse 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Here's your filter this week, guys. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That is our portion. That is our filter. And so even as we go through our week this week, I want to encourage us. My homework is be aware of your thoughts. And what you are choosing to think about, we get a choice. Just because it pops in there, it doesn't mean it needs to stay. <laughs> Does it fit through the filter of Philippians 4.8? Is it true, noble, just, lovely, pure, good report, praiseworthy? Secondly, where are your thoughts coming from? If you're going to choose to think about it and let it take time of your life, do you know where it's coming from? And if you don't know, just tell a friend. <laughs> They can, they can help you out really quickly because you're, if you're in a swirl, it's very likely that they're not. And then the next thing is this week, what can you stand on? What is a truth that you can stand on? Do we know who he is? What's a truth about God that you can stand on? We're going to pray. I'm kind of wrapping up fast. But I actually want to pray for people that um, have been battling discouragement that have been battling fear and anxiety because one thing that we get to do when we're together is we get to stand. We get to stand and pray that that would stop 
in the mighty name of Jesus and that he would strengthen you in, in that place. And so before we leave, I just want to take a moment to pray for anyone who has been battling discouragement because I've experienced it in interesting ways this summer and I'm, I'm a very positive person. So when stuff comes like that against me, it's like, oh, this is crazy. This is not normal for Candace at all. And so I want to make sure to pray for anyone who feels discouraged, has been battling anxiety and fear or torment. Would you raise your hand right now? Because I don't want you to leave this place the same way that you came in. And whether you're worried about if you're going to get married one day, if you don't have a job, and no matter what it is that is filling up that place, we want to pray for you. If you are standing in this room, you get to be the prayer team. That means that if someone is raising their hand around you, I want you to find them and put your hand on their shoulder. Put your hand on their shoulder. I want everyone whose hands raised is to have someone around them. Keep your hand up until people have touched your shoulder. And then I want to make sure everyone has someone. Look around. Because you're not supposed to leave in this place of torment. I can tell you that that's not God's, that's not his destiny or will for your life. And so we're going to stand as a family right now, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for the peace of God to come over them. So God, I thank you for my family right now. I bless everybody who's raised their hand. I bless my family. Lord, and I ask God for you to come and deliver them out of this place of torment, that you deliver them out of this place of discouragement, out of anxiety and fear. And God, I ask that you would come and be Jehovah Jireh, God our provider, but that you would come as well and be the great shepherd, the shepherd who knows the sheep, the shepherd who has exactly what his sheep need. So I bless you, and I bless your ability to receive what God has for you right now. And I say no more to torment, no more. You cannot rob, kill, steal, and destroy any more enemy. Yeah, we just pray a protection over you. And God, I ask over their minds, I pray for strength right now, that you would have the strength to hear God, that you have the strength to take every thought captive. Yeah, we bless you. I declare life over you in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, for life. Thank you, Lord, for provision. Yeah, and I thank you, God, for testimonies of deliverance right now. Yeah, so we stand around our family, and we just call you blessed and highly favored, and we just pray that the Lord would keep you, yeah, and the Lord would be near to you and would create a pathway forward for you this week. Yeah, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Make sure you give them a hug. If you prayed for someone, a high five, a hug. And then I just want to pray. I want to release one blessing over everybody. Shh, come back together real quick. Here's my final blessing. Shh. It'll be fast. I want to read Numbers 6, 24 through 26 over you. Shh. Real quickly. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Just sit here and receive this. This is a blessing over you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you experience peace that surpasses all understanding this week. May it guard your heart and your mind. Yeah, I bless you in Jesus' mighty name. If I could have my home pastors, my um, studio home leaders, any of our leadership make my way to this wall to my right, we would love to pray for you. If you're here and you would like more prayer for anything, we have a team of people that would love to pray for you. We're so thankful to be able to gather together, and I also am excited about the breakthrough that many of you are receiving today. Um, before you leave, remember the women's, if you want to help us with the women's night, there is a sign up over here on the table and have a wonderful week. It's great to see you guys. We love you. Have a good night, Dave.